Hi, everybody. It's Matt Scudero with the Credit Research Foundation. It is great to have you with us, and I'm extremely excited to bring a topic to you uh, that has come from not only the, uh, the membership, but our research committee um, over the past several, several weeks, uh, and one that is really a hot topic for us. So uh, we are um, very excited to have David Mayo with the Errant Fox organization with us. Um, as you may or may not know, if you do not know, Errant Fox is a platinum, uh, excuse me, a friend of the foundation, um, and not only a contributor uh, through webcasts, but also through written articles in speaking engagements, uh, in-person speaking engagements, um, and recently has written a uh, book on secured transactions for us, and we are uh, super excited to, um, to have them with us. And David, super to have you um, speaking with us on uh, this particular topic around set off and uh, recoupment. Um, so, David, I know this is a micro learning session for us. Yeah, you have some tremendous amount of content that we uh, have built into this. Um, and uh, so I just want to pass the baton off to you. And um, if you could share your thoughts with us, it'd be absolutely wonderful. Yeah, thanks very much, Matt. Um, thanks for having me. This is my personal uh, first presentation with CR CRF. So I'm very excited uh, to be here and to be a part of this. Um, so as Matt mentioned, um, we're going to be talking about the uh, very related, very similar, but uh, meaningfully different concepts of set off and recoupment. Um, and as the title of the presentation suggests, we're going to discuss the ways that you can use these uh, very important, useful, and valuable tools to minimize exposure uh, to a distressed counterparty and maximize rights and maximize your recovery, both in and out of bankruptcy. Um, and there's a here's a little bit of background information on our firm, and as Matt mentioned, Aaron Fox is a friend of CRF, and uh, very proud to be so. So, first off, what are they? What are set off and recoupment? What do they mean? How are they different? Um, it, they are typically referred to uh, very interchangeably and often in tandem, set off and recoupment, uh, suggesting. Uh, wrongly that they are really the same thing, that they're interchangeable. Um, and there's a reason for that. That's, that is that they are very similar. Uh, both concepts describe a creditor's right to apply a debt owed from the debtor against a mutual debt owed to the debtor. Um, so in short, they involve each involve the cancellation of mutual obligations to get uh, two claims, or two debts down to a single number. Uh, they look very similar in their application, which is why they're confused and used interchangeably, but they have some key conceptual and practical difference. Uh, conceptually, set off is generally asserted as a non-consensual self-help remedy. Uh, it's thought of as uh, an offensive or affirmative remedy, while recoupment in contrast typically serves as a defense. It's really an equitable defense to a claim from a transaction counterparty. And that way it is uh, thought of as a defensive remedy. Um, those are just conceptual and in general and on average how they are used, uh, but it can go the op opposite way. You can swap it, uh, set off can be a defense and you can use recoupment uh, offensively. And, and both um, are common answers or counterclaims uh, in litigation. Now, practically, the primary distinction between the two is that recoupment requires that the mutual debts being offset arise under the same transaction, while set off generally does not. Uh, so in that way, recoupment is um, a more limited remedy. There's a more limited universe of circumstances under which recoupment can apply. Now, the other uh, high level um, point that's important to keep in mind as we go through the rest of this presentation, as we get a little further into detail on these concepts, is that state law controls. Uh, state law creates these rights. Each state law creates these rights, uh, defines when and how they arise, and what steps need to be taken to exercise them properly. So we're going to hammer this point home in a few places um, throughout the presentation. We'll discuss their general requirements uh, across the board, how it usually works in most cases in most states, um, but you should always consult the state law in which you're operating um, to understand when the rights arise and how to exercise them properly, because there are risks to doing it the wrong way. 
All right, so we'll start with set off in general, and this is outside of bankruptcy. We'll, we'll spend some time talking about in bankruptcy. Um, but as mentioned, the right of set off allows entities mutually indebted to each other to apply their mutual debts against one another. Uh, the purpose is to promote efficiency, simplicity, and fairness. Uh, but you might really think of it as just promoting common sense or implementing common sense, uh, which has been recognized by the US Supreme Court in this often quoted uh, quote from a 1995 Supreme Court case called Strumpf, uh, set off avoids the absurdity of making A pay B when B owes A. So example, what does this mean in practice? Party A owes $100 to party B, party B owes 25 back. If party A was to implement a set off, um, it would set off the $25 debt against its own $100 debt, thereby paying party B only $75 and mutual satisfaction of both debts. So like I mentioned earlier, it's about getting down to a single number. Uh, as I mentioned, it's usually used offensively. It's an affirmative self-help remedy. And uh, state law is going to, or contract, um, this can be baked into the terms of the contract as well, but either state law or your contract are going to define the requirements um, for implementing set off in general. For set off to be valid, uh, there are three requirements that tend to uh, apply across the board. First is that they must be mutual. The debts have to run between the same parties. Uh, and at first blush, it's kind of common sense. Of course, you're going to set off mutual debts, but it can get a little trickier than that uh, when you're dealing with multi layered organizations with affiliates, subsidiaries, parents, uh, with business being done between them. So this is has to, the debts have to run mutually between the same exact entity on each side. Uh, the other requirements are they must be enforceable, valid and legal, and matured. They have to have come due. Generally, you cannot offset unmatured debts. Um, and yet again, told you I'd hammer this point. These are just in general. State law uh, may impose other conditions, restrictions, exceptions, limitations, as may your contract. All right, recoupment in general, as, as we talked about, limited to the same transaction or a single transaction, where set off doesn't have that requirement. Set off, you could uh, set off maybe a judgment claim uh, uh, against your counterparty um, against a contract claim that your, the counterparty has against you. It doesn't have to be in the same transaction or the same kinds of debt. It just has to be the same parties, valid and, and matured. Uh, but here with recoupment, same transaction or single transaction. And how you go about figuring out what is a single transaction? Well, the, the test varies by jurisdiction. Courts will apply different tests. The two primary tests applied are the uh, logical relationship test and the integrated transaction test. And the difference between these two is really just how strict are they? Uh, they both have to do with the nexus um, or the relationship between multiple aspects of business dealings between parties and whether they are sufficiently related to be a single transaction or whether instead they're just multiple unrelated transactions. Logical relationship, more permissive, more liberal, e in other words, easier to satisfy the requirement, integrated transactions, more restrictive. Court applying that test will take a much closer look at uh, the facts and the, and the contract if there is one. Um, these are just two tests. They're the most common, but there are others. There are other tests, there are other factors, particularly in bankruptcy court. Uh, bankruptcy courts are courts of equity. So they're gonna consider oftentimes other factors like fairness to creditors, how is this gonna impact the estate, things like that. Uh, policy purpose, we talked about set off um, is really about common sense. Recruitment is really about preventing unfairness uh, or unjust enrichment. Uh, the idea being that a party to a transaction a single transaction, uh, should not be allowed to enjoy that transaction's benefits without also fully satisfying its obligations. Um, and for that reason, th that's why it's usually a defense. So that's why it's, at least it's generally thought of as an equitable defense. Um, oftentimes comes up in the context of the purchase and sale of goods. Uh, and two examples of how recoupment can, can a recruitment right can rise and be exercised in that context. One is seller breach. Um, if the buyer orders 10 widgets, seller delivers 10 widget minis, uh, 
not with the buyer order. The buyer can use the, the widget minis. Uh, the buyer can exercise recruitment by accepting the goods, accepting the widget minis, notwithstanding the breach and recoup its damages through deduction to the purchase price. Uh, that's one way that recruitment can apply uh, and be exercised. Second example is prior overpayment. Uh, if the buyer has, has overpaid already, uh, the buyer can, can recoup its prior, over, prior overpayments through reducing its, its future payments under that transaction. All right, so these, these rights are set up in recruitment are particularly valuable and useful when you're dealing with a uh, distressed counterparty. Um, and here we'll, we'll talk quickly about outside of bankruptcy and, and considerations to keep in mind when you know that you're dealing with a distressed counterparty. Um, and the, the first thing to understand is the economic value of these rights in that context. Um, what, they, what they do, whether take before, whether taken before or after a bankruptcy filing, both set off and recoupment minimize exposure to the risk of non-payment from an eventually insolvent counterparty or from pro rata payment uh, from a bankruptcy estate if a bankruptcy is ultimately filed. Now, big picture key takeaway from this slide, um, if not from this presentation entirely is in general, creditors should not wait to exercise set off and recruitment rights when they arise, once you know you have them, when you're dealing with a distressed counterparty. You wanna minimize your exposure, maximize your recovery as soon as possible. And waiting too long can have harmful consequences. For example, if a bankruptcy is filed by your counterparty, the automatic stay and other restrictions, particularly on set off, uh, are gonna make the exercise of those rights more risky, complex, and expensive when you're doing it in bankruptcy uh, as opposed to outside of bankruptcy. Um, and it, it's true, there's, there are some risks to, uh, to taking, particularly a set off um, if a bankruptcy is ultimately filed and we'll, we'll get into that in more detail. Some set offs taken within the 90 day pre-filing period uh, can be avoided. There's some clawback provisions that will be on the next slide, but this should not necessarily deter you from taking action. If you know you have a set off right, uh, even if you think or suspect that a bankruptcy for your counterparty is around the corner, um, the potential for clawback shouldn't hold you back in most cases. Uh, one of the reasons is even if you think you, you've heard rumors or maybe the company has told you we're filing for bankruptcy next week, bankruptcy filings get delayed all the time. Uh, they can have a workout forbearance with their lenders and it can get pushed out 90 days or more and your set off will come out of the 90 day period uh, and then you'll be out of the woods on those clawback provisions. Again, the clawback provisions we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, other set of considerations that are very important when you're dealing with a distressed counterparty, take steps to maximize your rights. A um, couple of ways you can do that. First is maintain detailed records. This will help you recognize when these rights arise. So keep close track of, of payment records and timing, um, where the, you know, between which parties they're arising, um, and we'll get to that in a moment, um, but that'll help you recognize when the rights arise, and, and we'll talk about it later. It'll help you defend uh, against an avoidance action if you have to deal with that in bankruptcy. Second, structure, tra structure your transactions effectively. Uh, and set off, this can mean ensuring mutuality. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, that can get tricky when you're dealing with a counterparty who's doing business through multiple affiliates. So what you wanna do there is consolidate your mutual debts, one entity on your side, one entity on the counterparty side. That will avoid mutuality issues down the line. Um, and if you're operating under a contract, you can try to contract around the requirement that the debts be matured. Um, you, can, you can try to bake it into the contract if you can get agreement, it may not work, but if you can get agreement that you can set off unmatured claims and debts, um, that will increase uh, your, your set off rights. Recoupment, uh, first one's quite simple, put it in the contract. Um, it's not required under state law um, to, to put it in the contract, but it can only help. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt to define the right as clearly and specifically as possible, um, implement the terms that you want for how the right will be exercised. Uh, also for the single transaction requirement, consider memorializing multiple aspects of a business deal uh, into a single contract. 
um, like I said, you, you may uh, have multiple forms of uh, multiple aspects of a business relationship with a single counterparty. And if you can put it into a single contract, that can help. Um, you know, just bear in mind that just doing that on its own is not going to make it a single transaction. If in fact, it's really just multiple transactions, just put it in the same document. It's not necessarily going to fool a court, but if you view it as a single transaction, uh, put it in, put it in a single contract. All right. So I mentioned there are some risks to taking set off rights um, when you think of bankruptcy is around the corner. So let's let's talk about those. First thing to know is this is really about set off. Uh, the bankruptcy code has no mechanism for avoiding or recovering prepetition recoupments. So all the more reason if you have a recoupment right, you think a bankruptcy is coming, just go ahead and exercise it. But the bankruptcy bankruptcy code does permit a debtor or trustee to avoid or recover three types of prepetition set offs that are taken within the 90 day period pre-petition. The first we'll call the acquired claims set off. That's when a creditor's claim was acquired from another entity within the 90 day window and while the debtor was insolvent. Um, in that case, the debtor or trustee may avoid that set off under section 553A2. And the purpose there is to prevent a creditor from uh, buying a claim, uh, someone else's claim for cents on the dollar and then asserting the full value of that claim as a set off. Second category uh, we'll call the acquired debt set off. And that's when the debt owed to the debtor, not the claim owed from the debtor, but the debt owed to the debtor uh, was incurred within the 90 day window, again, while insolvent and for the purpose of obtaining a right of set off. That's also avoidable under section 553A. Now that's a very fact intensive, uh, fact -intensive inquiry, uh, can be difficult to prove intent. And so it's really all about proving intent. Uh, but sometimes it, it may not be so complicated. There, there have been cases where uh, the debtor trustee, all they had to prove was that the creditor knew a bankruptcy was coming or knew that the debtor was experiencing financial distress. That can be enough. Um, both acquired claims, acquired debt set offs, um, as mentioned, require uh, that the debtor be insolvent during that period when the set off was taken. 553C creates a rebuttable presumption of insolvency. That means that unless the creditor comes in and proves otherwise, uh, ins insolvency is presumed for, for the purposes of these, of these clawbacks. Uh, third category is called improvement in position setoffs. Uh, this can get quite technical uh, and mechanical, but basically it's, it's about um, preventing a creditor from taking a setoff within the 90 day window when they do better, when the creditor does better as a result of that set off, then, they, then it would have done had it taken it earlier in the 90 day period. So that can be a little confusing, but what you do is you look at uh, the way the statute works is you look at the insufficiency, uh, which is the amount by which the creditor's claim exceeds the debt owed to the debtor. That's the insufficiency, or that's the value of the set off, right? And you compare that to a hypothetical set off taken on the first day within the 90 day period on which an insufficiency also existed. You subtract the numbers, the difference, if there, if there is a difference is the creditor's improvement. And that's the amount um, that can be recovered by the debtor or trustee. Uh, important to keep in mind, acquired claim and acquired debt set offs also avoidable when taken post petition. So you can't buy a claim post petition for cents on the dollar and use it for a set off. All right, so now th those are the risks, uh, eventual risks of bankruptcy is filed, uh, the risks to having taken a pre-petition set off. Now we'll talk about a bankruptcy has been filed. Uh, maybe you have set off rights that you have not exercised or set off rights that arise post bankruptcy. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that. So the bankruptcy code, bankruptcy code does not create new set off rights, but it recognizes and preserves rights that already exist under state law or contract and imposes some other limitations and exceptions. Um, we already touched on the value of, of set off rights in, in bankruptcy. Um, it allows a creditor holding an unsecured claim to realize the full amount to the extent of its set off rights. So dollars and cents example, what does that mean? Creditor holds a hundred dollar unsecured claim, trade claim. Creditor owes 75 to the debtor. If the creditor has a set off right and gets bankruptcy court permission, which is required because of the automatic stay, we'll, we'll cover that. 
Creditor can do the set off, reduce its claim to un, uh, it's $25 unsecured, uh, netting out the 75. So now you have 25 as opposed to a $100 unsecured claim that may get pro rata or no payment. Um, to understand the value of that, I'm just going to give you the counterfactual, which is no set off right. In that case, you're left with a $100, $100 unsecured claim that could get paid 50 cents, two cents, nothing. But you still have to pay. Uh, the $75 debt in whole dollars. So absent the set off right, bad deal. All right, so set off is implicated throughout the bankruptcy code, but primarily in section 553, which is titled set off. So uh, this language here is the, is the language from section 553A that uh, recognizes and implements pre-existing set off rights. And the key language is bolded here. They have to be mutual, and both claim and debt to be set off must have arisen before the bankruptcy is commenced. Uh, you cannot set off pre-petition claims against post-petition debts. Um, the bankruptcy code actually doesn't say anything about setting off post-petition claims against post-petition debts, uh, post, you know, after bankruptcy in both cases. Um, However, some courts have allowed that, and, and it really makes sense to do so because of, it furthers the, uh, the policy of set off. Um, and again, remember that whatever, because the bankruptcy code does not create this new right, whatever the requirements under state law or your contract are, they still apply here in order to take a post petition set off. So the other two general ones we discussed are validity and enforceability and that the debt has to have been matured. The automatic stay applies, uh, hinted at that a moment ago, it expressly applies to set off, which means that um, to do a post petition set off, you need court permission. Court has to grant relief from the automatic stay. Um, always good uh, when, when practical to approach the debtor first, try to get consensual stay relief, uh, approach the debtor, try to negotiate a stipulation, lifting the automatic stay, uh, it's cheaper, it's simpler, and oftentimes debtors will, will be open to that if they don't oppose your set-off right. Uh, if you can't get that, or if that's not practical, you will have to file a motion. Um, and this is where uh, keeping detailed records will, will come in use. Uh, you'll have to thoroughly explain your right, state law, contract, uh, and attach your documentation that you saved. Invoices, payment records, correspondence, whatever. Um, Side note, some, you know, something to keep in mind, in contrast to bankruptcy uh, and receivership, an order of receivership may not stay set off rights. Receivership depends on state law. Sometimes it depends on the court. Um, but for more on receivership, uh, you should check out the companion podcast that's part of this series with Aaron Fox by my, my colleague, Justin Kesselman, uh, called Receivership 101. Important to keep in mind, very important, uh, do not accidentally waive your set off right. Uh, they can be expressly waived, of course, but they can also be implicitly waived. An implicit waiver generally results from just waiting too long to assert your right. So you don't want to wait until um, there's a plan on file or there's a, a sale waiting to be approved and, and give the debtor a reason to argue that your set off right is going to throw off their plans and, and jeopardize the reorganization. Um, and now, uh, filing a proof of claim, not all courts require that to recognize set off rights, uh, but that has been another source of, of courts finding waiver when creditors have, have either missed the bar date, not filed a claim, uh, or they failed to assert their set off rights in their claim. Um, so take away, file a proof of claim, always a good thing to do anyway, and put your set off right in the proof of claim if you haven't exercised it already. All right, recoupment and bankruptcy. Much fewer restrictions than, uh, than set off. We talked about how it's a narrower remedy in general because it's limited to a single transaction, but in bankruptcy, the bankruptcy code does, doesn't address recoupment in any way. And, and so there are fewer uh, restrictions imposed. Uh, for example, we, we covered that there are no, there's no impact on pre-petition recoupments. There's no clawback provisions like there are with set off. There's also no pre versus post-petition considerations. You can use a pre-petition claim a post-petition debt owed to, uh, owed to the debtor by you um, to accomplish a recruitment. Also, because it's, it's generally thought of as an equitable defense rather than a claim, 
usually it's not impacted by free and clear sales under Section 363F uh, or discharged. Now, automatic stay, uh, this is a source of disagreement among courts. Uh, we talked about how ex it expressly applies to set off. Recoupment is not mentioned in the statute. And so the majority of view is that it's not subject to the automatic stay, but a minority of courts have, have held otherwise. So consult counsel. The last thing you wanna do uh, is make a bad assumption and uh, try to exercise a recoupment and be held in contempt for violating the automatic stay. All right, so brief wrap up here. We, we've talked about some pointers, some strategies, some tips along the way. And the last couple of slides, we're just gonna briefly run through them. Uh, they're all just kind of rounded up here. And I hope that these slides can be a resource for you to come back to. Um, but first, this is outside of bankruptcy, set off and recoupment, know the law. Um, state law governs, unless you have a contract, then your contract governs. Uh, that'll tell you when you have the right, how to exercise it, what steps have to be taken. If you do it wrong, then if, if you if you try to do a set off, but you do it out of line with state law, then it's not a set off. It's just an invalid transaction, which can be avoided in bankruptcy by a debtor or trustee as a preference or fraudulent transfer. So know the law and follow it or know your contract and follow it. Uh, we talked about maintaining detailed records. That'll help you recognize when the rights arise, but also carefully document every step. When you do exercise the rights before bankruptcy, carefully document each step taken with respect to set-offs in particular uh, to help uh, defend against an avoidance action. We talked about structuring your transactions in a way to maximize your rights um, for both set-off and recoupment. I won't read those again, but those are those are set off right. Those are set forth right there. Uh, and the biggest one outside of bankruptcy, honestly, probably should be number one on the slide in hindsight, uh, do not wait. Don't postpone exercising your rights. In general, uh, you wanna go ahead and exercise your rights as soon as you have them, minimize your exposure. And you know, of course, we're talking about a distressed counterparty where you're facing down the risk of uh, insolvency. Um, and again, knowing that the, there's a potential avoidance of a set off uh, once a bankruptcy is filed, on its own, shouldn't that's that shouldn't be enough in most cases to deter you from doing it. Like we said, the bankruptcy can get delayed, and in general, it's just better to go ahead and and maximize your rights, maximize your recovery, and put it on the debtor or the trustee um, to to bring the action to claw it back. And you can always cut a deal after a bankruptcy filing. Avoid waiver, file a proof of claim, assert your set off or recoupment right in the proof of claim. Uh, it's not always required. Some courts do, but it's always a good idea. Um, again, don't sit on your set-off rights. Don't uh, give give any fodder to the debtor or trustee or committee that you waive them. Um, good news, recruitment rights generally not waivable, but both of those points are still good practice tips. File a claim and don't wait any longer than you need to. Uh, respect the automatic stay always applies to set off. We talked about a couple of ways you can go about getting relief from the automatic stay, consensual or not. Automatic stay sometimes applies to recoupment. Uh, so again, know the court or the judge's stance, consult counsel. Um, and when in doubt, if you don't know if this, this court hasn't ruled on it or something like that, uh, consider filing a protective motion, get a comfort order that says it doesn't, the automatic stay doesn't apply, or if it does, that it's lifted, that kind of thing and be prepared to defend. That's the last point. This is where uh, the records that you've kept, the, the detailed payment records, invoices, all the correspondence and in, in, in every deal um, are, are kept uh, readily handy for, for defense, right? That can be the acquired claim, acquired debt or improvement position set offs. It can be, if you did it wrong pre-petition and the trustee or debtor tries to claw it back as a preference or, or fraudulent transfer, your detailed records are gonna help you here. So that's that's the uh, end of the presentation. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this has been enlightening and helping you understand why these rights are so valuable, how they're different and, and how you can leverage them and be prepared to minimize your exposure and uh, maximize your recovery. And I'll, I'll pass it back to Matt. David, thank you. What an informative session and what an important topic for the credit professional. As I opened with, this is a topic that has come to us over the past several weeks as clearly one of the uh, top issues 
impacting the uh, credit professionals, certainly given with the, uh, the debt wave of activity uh, that's taking place. David, I can't thank you enough for sharing time with the community, um, taking time out of your practice to educate uh, the CRF folks here. And I know that if folks have the, uh, a question, they can certainly reach back to you um, or they can reach back to anybody on the Aaron Fox team. Um, additionally, they can reach back to CRF and we'd be more than happy to forward you over um, to, uh, to the Aaron Fox organization. Um, it was just a, a great partner of the foundation. Um, we are extremely appreciative of their uh, support. They are a friend of the foundation. Um, and again, as I opened with um, a constant contributor along all the fronts and communication points that we have uh, with uh, the community here. So um, David, I, I thank you. I think we'll close it at this point. Um, I uh, just wanna say, um, you know, I hope you uh, uh, stay healthy, stay safe. Uh, we look forward to seeing you live at a CRF event at some point. Um, and again, uh, much appreciation for all that you do. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. This was great and uh, happy holidays. Yeah, likewise. Take care and we'll look, look forward to seeing you soon. You Bye -bye. too. Bye.